Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Podcast on Fifth Ave. It's so good to have Jenna back from L.A. going to the Super Bowl. We were talking about that before, but yeah, was that just the, the best thing ever? It was so cool and so surreal. I, I was telling you, I'm like still kind of pinching myself. Like it doesn't feel like it actually happened. The halftime show was just as phenomenal as it was on TV. And mm-hmm. like watching it from, we were so far up that like watching it from afar, like you did see 50 Cent like hanging and then come back up. And I'm like, you know <laughs> what? Even if people kept making the jokes that he's like 75 cents or like 95 cents now, I'm like, you know what? I couldn't do that. So props to yeah. uh yeah. Props to him for that uh, in, insane little guest appearance there. But what yeah. a what a cool experience it was. I miss you guys, though. That is awesome. We missed, we missed you, too. Yeah. yeah. And it was definitely a good halftime show. There was there was another show that was quite the spectacle last night. Uh, could, it honestly couldn't have been more picture perfect. Sidney Crosby scored his 500th goal in Pittsburgh in front of a sold-out crowd against the Philadelphia Flyers. It was just like one of those kismet meant to be situations and you could kind of feel it coming. I was watching at a bar and it was just like, I was on the edge of my seat waiting while they were passing the puck around. And I was like, just get it to Sid, get it to Sid. And then I yelled when it happened and realized that nobody else was paying attention. So it was just a beautiful moment and just every, every single thing that happened last night was perfect. It was just all perfect. Even the teammates coming out onto the ice to celebrate with him, everything just felt so natural, but so destined. It just, it was an awesome experience and could not have happened to a better player or human being. Like I don't think anybody deserves it more than Sid. He's just, he's just one of a kind. Yeah. And I mean, so fitting that, that Malkin gets the, the lone assist mm-hmm. on, on that goal. I mean, the, the Penguins, the, the PR, they gave us a sheet of all the players that have assisted on Crosby goals and it's 107 different players. Malkin has, has assisted on the most with 109, um, including the one from last night. So, so fitting mm-hmm. that he's the only one. Uh, Sullivan did say after, you know, it was so appropriate that he did. And the only thing that could have made it better is if uh, Latang found a way to factor in two um, yeah. in that goal. But of course, Latang, he did score the overtime winner in the comeback because the, the Flyers scored three goals after that to go up. And well, I mean, Chad Ruedel scores the tying goal, the hero. Mm-hmm. To yeah. the overtime. <laughs> and then, yeah, it was only 30 seconds, 31 seconds into, into overtime. Latang and, and Crosby, they had that rush. And you look at it, like I asked the Tang after, you know, just walk us through that goal. And you look at him and he's looking at Sid the whole way up. They have a two on one. Mm-hmm. And because it would have been too perfect if he would have passed the Sid, Sid scores, you know, 501. Um, but yeah. yeah, he was trying to fool Carter Hart the whole way up. And uh, he takes that no look shot to, to score the, the winner. So yeah, just a, just a great story. I mean, at home um, in front of the home fans, he got to celebrate with his teammates um, his family was in town. I, I asked them after because they showed his, his parents on the video board and his dad was like tearing up. Um, mm-hmm. So I asked him about that, being able to share that with them. And he said they've been living out of a suitcase for a few weeks now, following him around, trying to be so they could be there <laughs> for that moment whenever it does happen. Um, so, yeah, good good to see everything come together the way it did. Mm-hmm. And we know, obviously, Sid and his superstitions and all the numbers, but just like it was so fitting in all of it. It was the 50th game of the season. It was Yager's 50th birthday. It was his 50th career goal against the Like, how does this – how – it's just – it's one of those things where you're like, okay, this is too perfect. This really is just too perfect. And the fact that, I mean, everybody on Twitter last night seemed to say that PBG Paints Arena – that's the loudest they've heard it in yeah. in probably like since pre-pandemic times. Yeah, I definitely without a question the loudest it's been um, all season. Uh, both when after he scored the goal, I mean they were chanting cheering his name for a while, but then also you know over time, um, definitely the loudest. But I mean I I know Dayan said you know even going back to you know 2017 Kunitz uh, when he scored the goal to ruin the Senators entire franchise uh <laughs> he said you know it, it seems the loudest it, it was since that i mean it was it, it was crazy and 
um you know they, they did talk about how you know they really fed off the the energy from from the crowd but yeah just uh just perfect the way everything came together yeah. It is. And when you look back at his career and the amount of injuries that he's dealt with, not just the amount of them, but the severity of yeah. a lot of them, the fact that he was able to come back after especially those concussions and continue to find his game and redefine his game and refine his game. Like he's just he has never missed a beat when he's been on the ice and he's always trying to find ways to elevate his game and he has had to overcome so many setbacks in over the course of his career so it it would have to also be incredibly special for that reason as well because looking back at that 2011 season when he went out with a concussion was like is he a is he ever going to play again? People didn't know. And to be here over 10 years later, having him hit this milestone and he's been playing phenomenally well all season. He like the, even when he's not scoring, he's factoring in points. He's playing lockdown defense. He's just all over the ice. He's so disruptive. He's one of the, if not the best captains in the league, he's, I don't know. I've never met him. I have met him. That's not true. I don't know him, (laughs) but I like, he just seems like what, Oh my God, who is this person? And I don't think I have enough good things to say about him because, or I I would never run. I am like flustered because I love Sidney Crosby so much. Like that's, that's how, much he means to this city that he can get us all up in our feelings and have us cheering for him as a person getting 500 goals because like that that's a milestone that players hit like players hit milestones pretty regularly but to have a city rally around a guy like that hitting a milestone like that just speaks volumes of how much he means to this town and to this hockey team and to his teammates he's just the best yeah I mean the just the reaction the way the the bench emptied Latang did say after you know they didn't plan that ahead of time you do see that sometimes when guys hit big goals like that um but yeah they didn't instead of just organic and he said um you know just knowing the type of guy Sid is he would have wanted to share that moment and remember it with his Mm -hmm. teammates um and Sullivan kind of said the same thing he said you know really give him goosebumps uh and seeing that the the emotion from his teammates and it was funny it um it took him a little while to come out for the post-game press conference and if you look at like the Instagram pictures after I think it's because he was taking pictures with like every single guy in the locker room like posing as a puck um I mean like one with like just Malkin and then with like Latang and Malkin and then like Gensel and Russ and everyone's posting pictures of Sid um I thought it was really funny. It's like Latang, he posted his and he said like, you know, like congratulations on 500. And then Malkin commented on it and he said, congrats on the assist at Gino. Like Malkin <laughs> was like congratulating himself for the assist, <laughs> which I don't know. It seems like the most Malkin thing ever to see from him. But oh um, God, I love him. yeah, just see, uh, great to see like those three guys and how they all were able to play a part in, in mm-hmm. this night. Live your life with the confidence of Evgeny Malkin commenting on that Instagram post. That is For you, real. That is the inspiration. But, I mean, it just is one of those things that we hear all the time, you know, all the players, especially when there's new players that come into the organization, like a Kasperi Kapanen, like a Brock McGinn, like a Dan Heinen. And these guys say, you know, you want to elevate your game because you're playing with Sidney freaking Crosby out there. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, for so many, I think even just us, I mean, for so many of us, you know, he was everything for our childhood. And now it's like you're yeah. fast forwarding, you know, 16, 17 years yeah. and he's still the face of the league. He's still, mm-hmm. you know, obviously yeah, there's a little bit of changing of the guard with some of the younger players that have kind of, you know, been in the spotlight. But at the end of the day, Sidney Crosby is going to always always be in that spotlight until the day he decides mm-hmm. to step away, which I don't know when that will be, which is also insane to think about. And mm-hmm. like, how crazy is it that we are living in the same time period where we get to experience uh. Sidney Crosby and we get to see his career and experience everything that comes along with it and see all these milestones mm-hmm. that he hit. 
it feels like an honor and a privilege to be able to watch somebody that talented play this sport and cheer for the team that he's on. Like it just, that it, it blows my mind that he, we have been able to kind of like grow up with him and watch him play and do all of this insane stuff and continue to be an ambassador for the league and, just, it's just a fantastic human being. It was a really special milestone, a special night in the middle of what is a, turning into a very special season for the Pens. Why don't we take a quick break, but we can talk about that a little bit more when we come back. And we're back. You might remember at the beginning of the season, all of the speculation, even among us, that this could be the the year that the Penguins finally miss the playoffs. And they probably heard us and were like those fools and then proved us way wrong. Um, they, their season has just been spectacular given all that they've had to deal with. And they're sitting atop the Metro right now at 70 points. Carolina has 67. They're first place in the division. Um, they, in terms of points overall, they're third in the league. They have 70. Tampa has 70 and Colorado has 72. So, and Tampa, uh, I don't know if you recall, has just come off of back-to-back cup wins. So they are in pretty elite company right now. And it really doesn't look like, Anything is slowing down. And now that I say that, I'm just going to do that really quick. But they have looked so good. And this playoff picture, at least in the in the East, is kind of coming into – it's kind of locking in. And it's looking like, yeah, this is, this is a thing. And the Penguins are probably going to be in the dance again. Yeah, I mean, you look at just the teams in, involved. I, I, The field is pretty much set. I mean, the wild card right now, the spots are Washington and Boston, and then it's a pretty big drop-off um, from Boston to the next team, Detroit. Uh, so I I think, you know, these are going to be the playoff teams. The order is probably going to, you know, switch up as, as we get further down the season. But, I mean, yeah, again, I we talked about it maybe like our first episode, second episode, like predictions for the season. I, I think I said that they're going to miss the playoffs and you go back to last season. I think everyone said the same thing too. And then they win the division. So I think that just shows, you know, you can't um, count, count this team out. And yeah. we've talked about it all year, the depth scoring and then, you know, the stars and I, now that they're healthy and we're finally seeing really, well, mostly healthy and we're seeing, you know, their potential, they're still not even fully healthy. We still haven't seen them fully healthy all season. They're fully healthy for like 12 hours and <laughs> then um, guys got hurt again. So um, it's going to be interesting to see what happens if, if they do ever actually get healthy. But, I mean, they're still just defying expectations. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And this is with a group, again, I feel like we've talked about all these guys so frequently throughout the season here, but like, this is with guys that aren't, you know, big name stars. I mean, I feel like I just, I mean, obviously you have the core and then you have Brian Rust and Jake Gensel doing what they're doing at the level that they're doing it. But this isn't, to me, like, I just, I feel like there's such a difference. You look at like a Colorado, you look at Tampa, and there's a difference between like the personnel on those rosters compared to the Penguins. And yet the Penguins Mm -hmm. are right there with them. Like Colorado coming into last, so what's today? Coming into Tuesday night, Colorado hadn't lost at home since December 16th. And they (laughs) just did on Tuesday night. So, I mean, this... The Penguins are in some pretty elite company with just the way that they're playing. And, you know, I feel like we keep talking about the ways they continue to find ways to win. I mean, even, you know, the game against the Flyers, is a perfect example. They're down 4-2 and you come back to not only force overtime, but get those two points. And we know how crucial every single point is, especially when you're coming into a stretch here now that – you're going to have Toronto on Thursday, Carolina on Sunday, and then the following Saturday you have New York. You know, three very solid teams that in the conference that really could kind of give us a little bit of a, 
okay, we've seen this team against some of the lesser teams, but how do they stack up against the high powered scoring offense of a Carolina? How do they go against the, you know, back and forth, um, up and down the ice pl- way the Rangers like to play? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's going to be interesting to see where the, the teams finally fall whenever we're closer to the postseason. But yeah, right now it, it it's looking pretty good for the Penguins. Taylor, you asked Twitter to ask us some questions for this show. So I'm going to, I'm going to let you take the floor. What did people want to know from us? Yeah, we had a couple of good ones. Um, I think a good place to start, uh, Brandon asks, uh, he has a two-parter, but so the second question he asks is, if you're Mike Sullivan, what do you do to get Kapanen going? Is scratching him or a trip to Wilkes-Barre the next best, best option? So Kapanen, that's obviously a concern right now. We just, you know, he was with Malk and, and we're not seeing that chemistry that we saw with him last year. Uh, Wednesday, they did adjust the practice lines a we don't know if we're going to see that in a game, but they did have, have a new middle six, and it looks like Kapanen's going to be moved down to the third line with McGinn and Rodriguez. And I feel like this is kind of Kapanen's last shot because the trade deadline is mm, three, four weeks away. It's March 21st. Uh, pretty Yeah, March 21st. So um, scratching him, I, I, don't, I don't know what that would do because we've seen, you know, in-game – bumping him down to the fourth line, really limiting his minutes. And and if that's not a wake up call, I don't think scratching him is going to be that wake up call that what what he needs. Trip to Wilkes Barre, I mean not not gonna happen. They're not gonna put him on waiver they tell you he'd have to go on waivers. They're not gonna put him on waivers. So it, it really it comes down to they need to figure it out. He needs to figure it out or maybe you look at a trade because they don't really have any options. And I think it, with where his value is at right now, you're not going to be trading him and getting like a, you know, defenseman that can really contribute something like that. I think it would be more to unload salary, maybe get back a pick or like a low level prospect back. And then use that freed up cap space as a precursor to a bigger move. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> the answer is that he just needs to find his game. Yeah. And it's one of those yeah. things, too, I mean, maybe the shakeup with the lines. I kind of do like that line from practice today yeah. because it seems like, at least with Rodriguez, you have kind of that speed where I think that's what Kapanen played off of so well last year. Mm-hmm. As we saw, like, him and Malkin, it was – everything was generated off the rush. Like, that's really where you got mm-hmm. the feel from, like, him, you know, flying into the zone, Malkin making a long stretch pass, and then him, like, deking the goalie. And it's one of those things – I mean, we saw it with – Jared McCann, when he went through his insane goal drought, you know, it's very hard for these guys to not get in their own heads. And so for them to be like, once you get one, kind of they keep coming. You know, once Mm -hmm. you get one domino all the way down, the rest will fall. Yeah, and I think that's what I was kind of expecting after that game where he scored his hat or he got his hat trick. Like, I I really thought that that was going to be the turning point for him for the season. And it he would find his game and find his legs, but it doesn't seem like that has happened with him. And it may just be a case of he is so far in his own head and that it just, there's are things that aren't clicking and connecting with him. And it is difficult because you, you can't have a guy who is supposed to be producing as much as they were kind of expecting him to laying eggs out on the ice night after night after night. And not just that, but like the mistakes that he is making just seem to be piling up and the, the very odd decisions and the, the, the inability to kind of maintain control of the puck. He just, it, I don't know. There's a lot of weird things going on with him and it, it's a, it's a really curious thing. I feel like they could write a, a movie on, about it it's just it's so fascinating we we talked two weeks ago about um I think I was advocating for them to call up Pustin and then they did call up Pustin and he didn't play and I I, I joked that you know there's a way for Captain to add value Pustin's English isn't great he can be his translator but then um the day they sent Pustin in down I did ask Mike Sullivan like did you need Captain to be his translator and Sullivan's like no his English is so much better than it was in camp like he's actually understands that he speaks it better so um, Pustin doesn't even need him to be his translator, but <laughs> oh, no. um, 
moving on to the next question. Um, this is from AP Spicy, who is Dominic Simone's biggest fan. He tweets at me about Dominic Simone on like a daily basis. Um, <laughs> he actually doesn't like Dominic Simone. That is, uh, <laughs> not serious, but uh, he says, what do the Penguins do at the deadline? Uh, at defense or backup goalie, I think they need both. Jenna, why don't you take this one first? This is a really good one, and I kind of keep toying back and forth. And I think kind of like the safe answer is just adding depth on defense. You can never have enough depth. And, I mean, we know Mm -hmm. the injuries and all of the things that this team deals with. And you knock on wood, we like to think that, like, at least in terms of COVID, things are kind of over the hump a little bit. Granted, we don't know. There could be something new that comes up tomorrow. But at least for right now, injuries are kind of really only that area. So you can never have – too much depth when it comes to defense, especially in the playoffs. Like that is how you make a long run here. Mm -hmm. And I think that you look at the chemistry of some of the lines offensively. And I think those will kind of, I don't want to entirely say figure themselves out, but I really think you'll kind of, you know, the top line is the top line. I think when you get a guy or two that sticks with Malkin on that second line, then all of a sudden things will kind of turn a little bit more. Maybe you add a bottom, I don't know, do you add a bottom six guy? This is kind of where I keep going back and forth a little bit, but I think the safe answer, at least for right now, I'm saying just go depth on defense. Depending on the goaltender market, if you want to dip your toe in. But again, I mean... And granted, obviously, I was, you know, Super Bowl last week, so it hasn't, I haven't been paying crazy, crazy attention. But I mean, DeSmith has definitely taken Mm -hmm. a turn for the better. So at least not in that pit of, oh my God, we got to, you know, we got to make a move because if Jari gets hurt or something like that, like there's a lot more confidence in DeSmith and he's seeing that in himself too. Yeah. And I think depth on defense is going to be key because if you, if you look at their forward depth, like even, even between guys like Brian Boyle and Drew O'Connor and Redeem Zahorna, like they have, they have a pretty solid pool to choose from mm-hmm. if, if they want to kind of shake those bottom lines up and, and see what they can, what they have and what they want to work with going into the playoffs. Like I think that once they finally find like, what to what the, whatever they're going to do with Kasperi Kapanen and they kind of figure out like okay yeah these are our top lines then they they have enough options for forwards it's that de- like defense is going to be key going into the into the playoffs and that's that's where they really are kind of putting emphasis on their game right now, like locking that down so they don't allow teams to take advantage of them and just skate all over them and that. Like, with when you look at teams like Tampa and Colorado play, it's just like all speed and you need to, you need to be able to combat that and, and locking things up on defense would be huge. And yeah, I don't necessarily think like the, the goaltending market is that solid and they, they may not, it, it, it's either going to be like a one for one, like you're going to get somebody who's comparable to Casey DeSmith or you're going to have to probably pay a little bit too much for a, a guy who is going to be backing up Tristan Jari. Like, I just don't, I don't know if, if Casey DeSmith continues to kind of swing upward, it, it seems like that would not necessarily be something that they would have to do. So yeah, I'm, I'm with Jenna. I think that that, that's probably where their, their focus should be. I, I think I differ. I think I, I'd address backup goaltending. I mean, Casey to Smith, he did. He's had two separate two-game stints this season where he's been very good. Um, yes. the, this recent one, before so he played against Philly, he, he really wasn't that great against Philly. He wasn't awful versus Philly. He's kind of evened out. But, yeah, the two games before that, and then he had a two-game stint where he was really good on, like, the Western uh, road trip, the first Western road trip of the season. But... Other than that, he's been pretty average to below average. And I just think once you get to the playoffs, if Jari falters or if he gets hurt, I mean, that's the season. I mean, you can't you can't turn to, I think, to Smith uh, regularly in the playoffs. I don't think they'd have the confidence to do that right now. I, there, again, I, there's Legacy, but I don't – I mean, not Legacy. That was last year. Um, yeah. Deming – they have Deming, but Deming's still hurt. He seemed like he might have been an option. He's still wearing the boot. Um, we saw him in the group picture with 
Crosby um, for his 500th goal. He's still wearing the boot. I don't know if he's still on the scooter. Um, I haven't seen the scooter. I think he's walking, but he's still wearing a boot. So um, that might have been the answer. I don't think he's not going to – I don't think he's going to be healthy in, in before the trade deadline for us to figure that out. So it yeah. would have to be – a trade and again the market I don't I don't know what it's going to be like a Halak I feel I believe he's off the table now he was he was an option I think maybe early in the season for teams looking for backup goaltending but then the Canucks got good Bruce Boudreaux came in and turned them around so I don't think that's going to be an option right now um Mm -hmm. there are going to be a couple of goalies that are going to be on the move but Flurry is probably going to be one of them I don't see I just don't see that happening um number one what were you going to say? I was say, was there a report the other day too? And I just, I should have probably followed up more on this, that like the cap, like we know the whole thing with the caps, yeah. but like the caps have reportedly called him multiple times and he's like, yeah, no, I don't no, want hang to. Hang up the phone. <laughs> yeah. um, I, think, I think that's from Frank, Frank Cervalli. I'm pretty sure this is who yeah. reported that. But they've tried maybe three times because I mean, he does have a, he, no trade, but uh, they've tried three times and he's been like, eh, no thanks. Uh, so... Um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, he could be on the move. He did talk today and, you know, he said he would. Um, he basically said, you know, he, the opportunity to win is, is an appealing one. Um, there's talk about Vegas bringing him back. Um, that that was something that's I, – I, I don't know how that got started, but that's, yeah. that's a thing. So there's going to be a lot of teams looking for – Holtby is the guy that could be moved. Um, just the depth that the that Dallas has, but um, Flurry, I don't think a reunion would really make sense. Just the money. I mean, they would have to like unload Capitan to make it happen. Um, just because the most Chicago would be able to retain is is half. He makes seven, which means it would be a three point five cap hit. You could get another team involved to retain more, but then at that point, you're going to be paying a ton for two teams to retain salary and. I just wouldn't make sense. Um, and I don't know if – I mean, Flurry. I think if he goes somewhere, he wants to be a number one. And I just don't – I don't know how good that would be for Jari. Um, yeah. Having him come in and uh, – I, I don't know if that would be good pressure on Jari or bad pressure on Jari, but I don't know. I don't I don't want to get the Flurry talk started again. But I, I think <laughs> – because that's all the fans want to hear. I, I, I think uh, – a backup goalie would be my my pick, and unless De Smith really really turns it around and really starts playing above average consistently, um, but even then, I don't know how confident they'd be in him in the in the playoffs. But I don't know. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. Well, why don't we take one more break and we'll be back with more questions and a celebration of a certain someone's fiftieth birthday. back once again taylor why don't you hit us with some more questions from twitter yeah so um bill p says so the crosby line has been great thus far however i have a bad feeling it will not be successful in the playoffs due to the officiating changes in the playoffs the islanders manhandled 59 and 17 last year any thoughts on possible changes to line combinations uh in the playoffs jordan why don't you take this one first <laughs> i i think that given the the Penguins' recent history of utter turmoil in the playoffs may have Mike Sullivan a little bit more apt to shake up the lines because there really wasn't a ton that was modified once they got into the playoffs when they got swept by the Islanders and then everything against Montreal. Like, it just felt like everything was kind of stagnant. And I I don't know. I'm not... I'm not ever the type of person that is, well, that's, I I don't, I don't really like to look ahead and be like, well, what if they don't keep performing? Like I'm, I'm kind of sitting in the, well, they're going to perform this well until or unless they stop. So I, I feel like if, if they can keep this up going into the playoffs, which I, I really hope they can. I don't want them to touch a single thing on that top line, but I would, I would love to see um, maybe 
if they're going to change anything, maybe slide Evan Rodriguez back up to the top line to play with Sid and Gensel and then slide Russ down to Gino's line. I think that they've always had some pretty solid chemistry in the past and Evan Rodriguez played phenomenally well with Sid earlier in the season. Like he was, he was doing really well. I, I think those would probably be the only changes that I would make because I, I think that there's just something so special about Sid and Jake together that I would not want to separate those two. Like if you're going to move anybody off the line, move Brian Rust, slide him down so you get his ability a little bit deeper into the lineup. And it, it, it also all depends on what happens with Kapanen. Like it, because that's going to, that's going to matter moving forward. But I, I think that if I were to shake it up, if we do see the, that first line become a little bit stagnant, Erod back up with Sid and Jake, Rust back, Rust down with um, Gino, and I don't know who else I would slide up on that line because I because I really love what I've been seeing from uh, the Simone Boyle Aston Reese. Matt like line I, th- I think that they've been great so it, I wouldn't want to tamper with anything too much but if you have to you have to but right now they don't have to so I think that I'm just going to keep hoping that they can they can carry this off into the playoffs Jenna what do you think yeah th- this is one of those things it's like it's you know if if you don't have to you know right now the way that they are playing. It is just so phenomenal to see. And I mean, the way Brian Russ is scoring, I think that's so right now he's what I, I'm going to butcher the stat. I either want to say seven or 17 and both of those feel wrong, but he's scored like what eight goals in the last seven games, something to that extent where, you know, he's almost scoring a goal a game for this team. So until he cools off a little bit, which again, you anticipate a little bit with some of the guys, but I just don't see that happening with Brian Russ right now and knowing what's ahead for him potentially this summer. He kind of wants to be able to be like, Hey, look, here's what I can do. Here's all of my abilities. Granted, you know, I think it also kind of comes into play with the power play a little bit because the way that the power play is contributing to, you know, the top line may not be scoring all these crazy, even strength goals, but when you're having a decent majority of your guys be able to capitalize in those special teams situations, then it's like, Mm. Hey, they're still getting the production. It just might not be, you know, okay, they're shut down when it's five on five, but when you have that man advantage and, oh, look, Sid's scoring again. Oh, look, Gensel tallied another power play goal. Oh, look, so did Brian Russ. Like those types of things really bode well for that top line and kind of, you know, get that. Or even, you know, when we see like the power play expire and then, you know, as the skaters coming off the ice or something, then they score, you know, we hear, I think Mike Sullivan said that the other day, you know, it doesn't entirely have to be about the power play scoring, but you just kind of generate momentum that way. Mm -hmm. Can they sustain momentum like that when things get tough? You know, we look Mm -hmm. at, I, I go back to the Boston game a little bit where it's always, it always feels like they look to shut down the top line and it's like, okay, they Sid didn't contribute on the score shoot or score sheet, but he scored on the power play. And then Brian mm-hmm. Russell played. like those are the types of things that maybe at five on five. And, you know, again, this is shoulda, coulda, woulda in the sense where, yeah. you know, right now they've been playing so well. Yes. Playoff hockey is an entirely different animal, but for all we know, they could carry this momentum in and that top line could be, you know, go off for two goals a night type thing. Yeah. You never yeah. know. Yeah. And the the specific question from Bill, it's the Islanders manhandled Gensel and Russ last year. I, I don't know if he's suggesting maybe they add someone bigger up there to serve as like protection. I don't, I don't know. And I, I, I think not, that's not necessarily just a playoff hockey thing. That's like, the way the Islanders play, they're not, and they're not yeah. going to be playing the Islanders in the playoffs. So, uh, some a team like maybe Carolina, you're, it's not gonna, it's not gonna, it's not the same system, it's not the same style. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, uh, moving on, Tyler, he says, do you see Matt Cullen having a permanent spot behind the bench at some point? So, backstory: uh, the Penguins injury bug. It's moved on to the coaching staff. Uh, Todd Reardon. Uh, who coaches the power play in the defense? He uh, 
is on IR. So they recalled Matt Cullen o- over the All-Star break. Reardon, he was shoveling snow from his driveway, slipped on ice, hurt his knee. He underwent surgery on Monday. Um, it sounded like they didn't know for sure how long he's going to be out, but uh, they, they, they're keeping him engaged virtually whenever he's able. Um, in the meantime, uh, Volucci is going to be handling the D on the bench in game. Uh, and to also take over some of the responsibilities, Matt Cullen, they brought him in from Minnesota. He's, he, he comes in maybe once a month normally, works with the forwards, the PK guys, face offs. He does that kind of stuff. Um, and he also works, you know, virtually that with the same guys, but. Um, they brought him in to help do some of the pre-scouting, and he was behind the bench on Tuesday. Uh, I, as far as having a permanent spot behind the bench at some point, I, I there's just not room right now um, because Ty Hennis is typically back there. Um, skill, skill, so that I don't know if there's a limit on how many coaches you can have, but I mean the Penguins do have Volucci and Reardon, and then Hennis is new uh, this year. He, to the bench. Um, he handles more of the system, systematic type things or, or individual players. He's not, you know, focusing on fours or defensemen or any um, particular group. But uh, so Matt Cullen, maybe as an, maybe could he have an assistant coaching job like in the future somewhere, um, rather be in Pittsburgh or whatever. I, just, I don't know, maybe um, the type of guy he yeah. is. I think that he's going to keep moving up the coaching ladder. Um but as far as, you know, when Reardon's healthy, will Matt Cullen be behind the bench full-time? I would say no. Jordan, what do you think about uh, Matt Cullen being back? I would love it. I think that he's he has a way with the guys, and that was so evident when he was a player on the team. They just all respected him. They listened to him. He had a a really special way of communicating with them. With them. I I would love to see it. Obviously, like you were saying, it just doesn't, it's not feasible right now. But if they could find a way in the future to get him behind the bench, I would love that. I, I love that guy. I think that he he was around in Pittsburgh for some really special cup runs. And I mean, they're all special, but the, the back-to-back cups were just, they were something else. And he was, he became a part of, just a huge moment in the franchise. And it felt like whenever he left, it was kind of heartbreaking in a way. I really wanted to see him stay. So coming back, it was great. And I just, I would, I would like to see him at some point in the future back there a little bit more, but yeah, it's not going to happen this year, which is fine. Yeah. I don't, I also don't know if he wants to like live here full time. Just, just his family. He has what three young boys are playing Mm -hmm. his family's in minnesota that's why he's still there full time Mm -hmm. um and it just kind of makes uh trips uh jenna anything to add on uh matt cullen i know you weren't in pittsburgh when he was here as a as a player but i was gonna say you guys pretty much touched on all you just kind of see i mean the way that the team responds when he comes back you kind of you, you can feel that like sense at practice when they're like oh he's here like it's almost like I almost want to say, like, kind of compared to like the cool uncle that shows up, <laughs> the cool uncle that like has all these awesome things that like loves to work with you and sit down with you on your craft type thing. So, I mean, they just respond really well when he's here. So, this could be, you know, something maybe potentially in the future. But yeah, I think right now it's just kind of the situation that it's in. It's like, hey, we're really happy to have you whenever you're here type thing. Next man up. Yeah. Um, yes. and then, last of the questions we're going to get to Brandon. He had another one. Uh, if you're Ron Hextall going into this offseason, what are your priorities? Any contracts you'd like to get rid of? Who will realistically be resigned, et cetera? Uh, Jenna, you want to start with this one? Mm. This is the hard one. These are all <laughs> difficult because it's like it is so many different ways. I think if it was me, and then obviously, too, I need to look a little bit more into all the numbers to make everything kind of happen. But like, I think you have to make depending on what this team does in the postseason, I think if this team this year goes out and wins a cup, things are entirely different. Or if they make it, you know, if they make it to the Eastern conference finals, or if it's close enough where it's like, we need that one extra little piece or like, you know, we made it to a seven or seven game series and lost, you know, 
three, two or something like that. If there's something where you can tangibly say, we know that we will be able to recreate this and get to where we were next year, then I think you have to make it a priority to keep the core. You have to keep Latang. You have to keep Malkin. However, if God forbid things fall apart and go crazy and all that, I still think that Ron Hextall just needs to make those two a priority because at the end of the day, that all goes back to Sid too. You have Sidney Crosby on this team. Those are Sid's two guys. They played together for so long. That is where it needs to be. Plus, if you get rid of Chris Letang, it's so hard to replicate what he does, just the minutes he plays. I think that's such an important thing. Then there's the whole Brian Rust conversation, which yeah. is a really different animal to tackle because realistically he is going to make more money somewhere else. He could go to another place where he can still be a top line guy, but at the same time you look at him too and it's like, okay, but what he does is kind of irreplaceable right now because mm-hmm. of the way that he scores. But I mean, it's, and it's tough when we look at these situations too, because people always want to get so angry at the player. It's like, oh, well you left and you did this and you could have done that. And as much as it hurts sometimes when these guys leave, it's like, okay, but this is their job and this is their livelihood. And if you were telling, you know, average Joe Schmo on the street, Hey, you know, you might have to leave where you are, but we'll pay you three more million dollars than what you're making right now. Who like, you know, tell no, me yeah. it's hard to say no to those types of things. Mm-hmm. Very and- few players spend their entire career in, in one city. That's just how it is. And Brian Russ just might not be the kind of guy that spends his whole career in Pittsburgh. He might be on the move eventually, but yeah, mm-hmm. he, he might price himself out of Pittsburgh. Yeah. I, I think that's going to yeah. be a more realistic thing at least, but I think you have to, depending on what you do, I mean, with where this team is at now, again, we don't think there's going to be a huge fall off, but if they sustain this and they are a legitimate, I mean, I think right now they're a legitimate cup contender, but yeah, if you sustain that and you, you know, win a couple playoff series and we're talking finals and it's like of course you have to keep this group intact as much as you can because you know the potential is still here the window mm-hmm. is still open yeah jordan what do you think that i mean she pretty much touched on everything important i i have a hard time saying that they shouldn't at least try to keep brian rust like it's it's hard to to look at what he's doing and, and just kind of like, and let that go. Like Jenna was saying, it's what he's doing right now. It would be really difficult to replace. And I think they need to at least have the conversation. However, if it comes at the expense of losing a guy like Malkin or Latang, it, I don't think that's necessarily worth it because that's, that that's just something that, I don't think they should even consider, but th- he he has to at least be on the table for potentially re-signing him somehow because he's. I, I would find a like, I would do everything that I could to find a way to make that happen. And if you get to a point where you're like, yeah, it's just not going to happen, then okay, it it is what it is. But they they're going to need to do some some soul searching and, and figure it out because he's, he's really special. And what he's, what he's been doing this season has just been so fun. Yeah. And if, if it looks like you, you're not gonna be able to resign him, I definitely there's people have suggested trading him to a team, you know, looking to add a rental. I don't think that should be on the table at all. The penguins win. Now the penguins are the type of team that should be adding rentals, throwing everything they can at this team right now this year. So I, if the, you can't re-sign Russ, I think you just have to let him walk in, in free agency. I, I mean, it's not it's not a given that, you know, at least one of these, you know, guys is going to be gone. I mean, there's going to be ways to shed salary cap in it. I, I, unless he really turns it around, I don't see him being back. And right there is uh, – he's, he's going to be a restricted free agent. You can just not qualify him and let him walk. And that's $3.2 million. You can free up right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of Aston Reese, he's going to be a free agent right now. He's making one point seven. I don't think he would get that much or a raise. Um, Heinen, I mean, you could let Heinen walk and maybe bring up a cheaper guy like Nylander from Wilkesbury for for next year, someone like that. Yeah. Um, Zuck, Zucker, if if you could unload him because he's not he's not worth his contract. What's his what's his cap hit? Um, 
Is it like four? Yeah, it, th- five and a half. Five. Oh, Jeez, Louise. He's, I thought he's, it was four seven or something. But yeah, he, he's not worth the five and a half. Now, moving him is, is harder than it sounds. If, if The strategy can't be trade all your bad players for other teams' good players. Because <laughs> he, he does have, um, what is it, one more year after this. They're... You might have to retain salary or, I don't know, if a team like Arizona who uh, has the cap space would, would take him on for for not much in return, you, you there, there's ways to shed salary, and, I mean, that would free up space to resign some of these guys. Evan Rodriguez, too, he's the guy that might price himself out of Pittsburgh uh, $1 million right now. That's a very good bargain for what he's been bringing. Yeah. But then if you're Evan Rodriguez, would you want to go somewhere for more money? Because you look at, I mean, where, what he was doing in, in Buffalo and just the boost that coming to Pittsburgh added to, to his career. It is kind of a short sample size. If, if he goes somewhere that offers him more money, is he going to be able to carry that over to that new team? Or is it more about who he's playing with here and um, systems, stuff like that? So... I don't know. I don't know if you'd call it a hometown discount because he's not like a hometown guy. He hasn't been here that long, but uh, maybe you can get Rodriguez for cheap. But yeah, I mean, there's and yeah, you don't know what the Malkin Latang contracts are going to look like. Matheson, his uh, contract's pretty high too, four point eight. He has one, one, two, three, four more years after this. Wow. Um, that one, I don't think you're going to be able to move that one <laughs> so i think if you're gonna dump a bad contract it's gonna be zucker um just because of the term left but um there are ways that they can finagle this and keep all these core guys back uh casey to smith mm-hmm. he's gonna be he's gonna be a uh, free agent i don't see him being back maybe mm-hmm. um i don't know uh they, that, yeah. if, if they don't upgrade the backup goalie this trade deadline that might be uh, something they address in, in, in free agency. Yeah, yeah it, it'll be interesting to see what they do, but I think they know what their priorities need to be, and they'll they'll do everything they can to make that happen. One final thing, we want to wish a very happy birthday, belated, but birthday nonetheless to Penguins icon, a, a hockey icon. Life legend, Yammer Yager. He turned 50 on Tuesday, correct? Day after Valentine's yes. Day is his birthday. Yep. Yeah, And he's, yep. he's so, still playing. He's still playing professional hockey for the team in Cladno, the team he owns. Um, he's been asked a million times, like, what keeps him going, why he's still playing. Um, I, he Gretzky recently asked him on a TNT broadcast, and he just, you know, he talked about his love for the game. He's also said things like... Um, you know, he owns the team, and just the attention him still playing brings to that team. He said financially, you know, um, he doesn't re- – him retiring, he, he doesn't know what it would do for uh, the money the team brings in, the revenue. So, like, that's kind of driving him too. But then also mm-hmm. it feels like every, like, other year or so someone asks him, and he says that um, he doesn't want to retire and get fat, like – <laughs> Linda Cohn asked him, you know, like, you know, kind of what keeps him going in like 2016. He's like, well, sometimes I eat seven to eight muffins a day. And he's like, so I know what would happen if I retire and I keep eating these muffins. And it's like, well, maybe cut back on the muffins. But he, but he said something like that. Like, you know, people ask him, like, you know, are you going to retire? And he's like, what else would I do? Just get fat? So um, that's keeping him going. But uh, I don't know. His his number's going to be in the rafters at, at PPG Paints Arena someday. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mario said that much at, at the 100, the NHL 100, the 100 greatest players, mm-hmm. that, that kind of whole thing. Yeah, He's going to be there eventually. He just has to retire first. I mean, you might <laughs> see like 87 and 71 in the rafters before 68. He's just going to keep going. Um, but I think that would just be so perfect. I mean, 87 and mm-hmm. 71 up there one day, um, 68 and 66 next to each other. And then twenty one yeah. for, for Breer, but um, I don't know the the story of how the Penguins ended up even got Yager is like the greatest story ever. They got him fifth overall in nineteen ninety, and he was the most talented player going into that draft. But 
just coming from Czechoslovakia, or was Czechoslovakia at the time, there was a question of, you know, is he actually going to come over? When is he going to come over? Is he going to be stuck there? And you go back to when he was 13 years old. Um, Czechoslovakia hosted the World Championships. Mario Lemieux played in him. Um, and he he wrote about this in his autobiography from 1997 that he was obsessed with Mario ever since then. Um, he would watch Mario's games, yell at the TV. His mom's like, who's Mario? Who you keep yelling at? He carried <laughs> Mario's picture in his wallet. So then, you know, a couple of years later, it's 1990. It's time for him to be drafted. Five years later, um, the Penguins pick fifth. And so the Nordiques have the first pick. In the pre-draft interviews, they asked Yager, you know, like, when when would you come over? And he's like, oh, I don't know. Maybe not this year. Canucks, Red Wings, Flyers, they go. He kind of tells them the same things. The Penguins ask him, Craig Patrick, the GM, uh, ask him, you know, when would you come over? And Yager says, I will be there tomorrow. Uh, so, <laughs> so he lied his way, he finessed his way through the pre-draft interviews to ensure he got to play with Mario, his hero. Um, they win two cups in his first two years together. He also said in his autobiography that he kept that picture of Mario in his wallet, like well into when he was actually playing on the team. And he said, you know, he would have been he would have been the laughing stock of the team if Mario, uh, if anyone found out that he was carrying Mario's picture in his wallet after he was already on the team. But um, <laughs> I don't know. It just the 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 team wouldn't um, be here if it weren't. For Yager, I think, I mean, they would have gone bankrupt. When when Mario left, Yager carried the team in his absence. Um, yeah. He scored the goal to get them into the playoffs. Um, I can't remember which year it is off the top of my head, but um, basically they needed the Penguin money troubles. They needed to, the revenue from the playoffs to just kind of get them by, and Yager scored the goal to get them into the playoffs. I think he said at the time was the most important goal of his career just because of what, what it did. Um uh, maybe one final Yager story. The other goal I remember him saying that was the most important of his career, they're playing against the Whalers. The Whalers head coach was uh, Pierre McGuire, who mm-hmm. was he an assistant coach. He was a scout for the Penguins before that. And Pierre knew that Yager used an illegal curve on his stick um, from the Penguins, and Yager was still using in that game. Pierre waited until... Um, I think it was a tie game there and he, he was keeping this in his back pocket for he challenged it. Yager got a penalty for using the illegal stick. Um, and then in overtime, Yager comes out and he scores the game winner. Um, and yeah, Yager said that was the most important goal of his career because it shut up Pierre. I think he called him a know-it-all. So uh, just huge respect for Yager for doing that. <laughs> Tumping on Pierre McGuire, but um, <laughs> great guy. I'm honestly we could do like a couple more episodes just focusing on like Yager stories, but um, yeah, great to see him still going, even if it's just because of the muffins. <laughs> I love he's, it. I love it. He's a madman, yeah. and he has he's established quite the legacy for himself. Uh, he's he's something else. But happy fiftieth, uh, Yammer Yager. You or an enigma and just beyond entertaining all the time. (laughs) Thanks for being you. And thank you everybody for listening to another episode of podcast on fifth Ave. We're on Twitter. So go ahead and follow us there. If you want to keep up with some fun hockey news and we are also always dropping episodes every Thursday. So make sure you're subscribed wherever it is. You listen to podcasts We're on YouTube as well so that you don't miss an episode. We will see you next week.